Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our flagship building on the Mall. It's a, the program this morning is a downlink with astronauts on the International Space Station in recognition of International Education Week. Today's event is a collaborative effort among the Smithsonian Institution, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the U.S. Department of Education, and the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program of the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. In addition to the eager group of students we have here in the museum, more than 9,557 students will participate by live webcast being made possible by NASA television. We hope this memorable educational experience will inspire all of you to learn more about the space program and develop a lifelong interest in its future. Our Earth-based location for today's program, the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery, is a perfect setting because it explores the history of human spaceflight with a special attention to the shuttle era. This is one of the most dynamic galleries in our museum, and along with the artifacts and interactive displays, it serves as a location for live performances as well as te television broadcasts and webcasts such as we're doing today. The sponsor of the Moving Beyond Earth exhibition is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The Smithsonian Institution and NASA have been working together for decades. In 1966, the Space Act Agreement established the Smithsonian as the official repository of the nation's space artifacts. In April, NASA delivered the Space Shuttle Discovery to our museum site out at Dulles Airport, the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center. The Smithsonian Institution has embarked on an ambitious plan that puts its original mandate, the increase in diffusion of knowledge, in a new light emphasizing education. Our plan also promotes the benefits of collaboration, and today's event is an excellent example of both collabor collaboration and education, and it's our honor to work with the Department of Education. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, Mr. Tony Miller. Thank you very much. Uh, really is my pleasure to be, to be with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Tony Miller, and I am the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Education. Um, and I hope you all are as excited as I am to be here. Uh, I want to thank, thank in particular the Johnson Space Center, Teaching from Space Office, who we've partnered with over the last 10 years, and who is responsible today for bringing us the downlink and allowing us to participate. I also want to thank the Air and Space Museum. Um, I can't think of a more fitting place than to be here for today's event. Now, in just a few minutes, we'll be talking with the space station commander, Sunita Williams. Now, she holds the world record for the woman who has spent the most time in space. And we'll also be talking with NASA astronaut Kevin Ford. So I hope you have your questions ready. Now, we're, while we're still waiting for the space station to begin, to they need to get in range so that we can communicate, for those of you who understand and the, the space communication as we'll learn about today. I want to use the next few moments to talk to the students in the room and almost the 10,000 students in, in their communities in the United States and Canada who are joining us online. Now, when I was your age, which was clearly a, a little while ago, um, I remember watching Star Trek and seeing the latest James Bond movie. And I would see all these amazing gadgets, and I'd wonder, wow, will those things ever be real? Will I be able to kind of do the kinds of things that I'm seeing in the movies and on TV? And now it's remarkable that I take for granted some of those very things that seemed to be so way out there and futuristic when I was your age. Things like personal computers, personal entertainment devices. So think about it and ask yourself. What are the things today that you think about seem way futuristic, almost hard to imagine? Think about those things. Which ones of those do you think will be a regular part of your life when you're an adult? I bring this up because it's very likely that some of you, some of you right here in this room, 
will be the ones to create the equivalent of the next cell phone, to create the internet, to create the next tablet, and to bring about scientific advances that will help us solve global problems for people all over the world. You're growing up in an exciting time, but also a time when we're facing some big challenges that are going to require the best thinking intellectually, the best thinking creatively, and frankly, a real sense of humanity. And I want to stress to you then the importance of your education and the need to be physically fit. Because being a healthy citizen is the combination of a healthy body and a strong mind. So since taking my current role here, I help to lead the improvement. Where I, where I, what I do now is I help to lead the improvement of the US education system. Now in that role, I've had the pleasure of meetings with my colleagues from countries from all around the world. And the conversations we have have shown me that the challenges that we face, they're the same in the US, in China, in Brazil, in Russia. We all agree that it's education that will lead kids out of poverty and that will give you a chance. We recognize that whether you want to be an astronaut or a doctor or a teacher or a technician, if whatever inspires you, that you must value your education and your health and the role that both will play in opening up opportunities for you to follow your passions. And as the Deputy Secretary of Education, but frankly, as a father, I have the same hope for you that I have for my own son. And that's both you and he can grow into the global citizens who are able to pursue their dreams at home and abroad, or frankly, even in outer space. I hope you'll take some time to thank your teachers. I'm sure both of these astronauts will tell you that, you, that they had some pretty engaging math and science teachers who inspired them to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, what we call STEM. And so it's important that the role that teachers and your parents have been playing. They play a very important role, and, uh, and I hope that, that you will be encouraged as you pursue your careers in STEM and think about becoming the next set of teachers to inspire future generations of innovators and dreamers. Now, speaking of innovators, an exciting part of today's event is that this year we're working with the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education to see students' work actually in action. This unique student spaceflight experimental program gives students around the globe the chance to bring their science experience on microgravity to outer space. So I want to thank you today for allowing me to share this moment with you. Now let me hear who's ready to talk with the space station. You ready? Station, this so, is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Uh, yes, we are ready. Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. They Don't said do flips. Great. National Air and Space Museum, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Yep. Okay. Station? This is Deputy Secretary Tony Miller, along with students, scientists participating in the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. How do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Welcome aboard. All right. <laughs> I would tell you my commander's upside down, but perhaps it's the camera that was upside down, and me. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's very exciting to be here, and we're really looking forward to, to having our students talk with you and learn about what it's like to be in space, and they could ask you some of your questions. Well, it's an honor to be here at Smithsonian with you, and uh, yeah, when you're upside down or upside right, your hair still stands on end. <laughs> hey, Sonny, this is Leland. You at least have some hair. 
<laughs> hey, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, let me I know you weren't you. talking about me, Leland. I think you were talking about yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, Kevin. Is there a time limit that you're allowed to stay in space? That's a very interesting question. You know, usually we're up here about six months because that's the lifetime, approximate lifetime of the Soyuz spacecraft, which is the way we got up here and also our rescue boat and the way we're getting home. But we're thinking about now in the near future having people stay up for longer, possibly a year, and then we could do all sorts of long-term science experiments on them and have them be very experienced while they're up here, sort of leading down the path on our next steps, uh, going on further space travel, leaving low Earth orbit. So yes and no, I think, is the answer to your question. Thank you, ISS. Our next question comes from Callaway and Pleasanton, Nebraska. Nebraska, go ahead with your question. We read that being in space causes fluid to swell in your brain and increases pressure on your eyes. Could you describe this feeling for us? Uh, absolutely, it's, it's true because uh, you're so used to being in the one gravity environment that you're on on Earth and your muscles and your vascular system compensates for that and keeps the blood pressure usually high in your head. So when you lose the gravity and when you come to space, the blood pressure just naturally increases in your head because it doesn't have to pump against gravity anymore. And so for the first couple of weeks, I've been here about, uh, oh, maybe three and a half weeks now, something like that, and uh, in space that is. And uh, so uh, when I first got here, I really felt the swelling in my head and I feel a little bit of congestion. It goes away with a few weeks time though and uh, your body adapts to it very well. So it's just one of those things that's initially with you during your space flight and then uh, the body compensates. Okay, thank you, ISS. Our next question comes from uh, Presidio, Texas. Presidio, go ahead with your question. What advice can you give young kids like me about pursuing our dreams? ISS, did you copy? question was uh, what, what to tell um, kids like you who want to live and uh, fulfill your dreams. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, well, um, let me just tell you a quick little story about myself. I sort of felt that I was a little bit in second place my whole life. You know, swimming, I didn't get into a uh, college that I wanted to, my first choice. I didn't get to fly jets, I flew helicopters, and so, you know, I didn't always get to do exactly what I wanted, but you know what? Um, it, the path that I ended up taking got me really interested in learning about how helicopters work, which sent me to test pilot school, which got me interested in being an astronaut. So the point of my story is here, and what to tell kids about living their dreams is, you know, you're going to be disappointed along the way, but that's okay, because it's going to open new doors and new things for you to think about and learn about, and uh, just have your eyes wide open and get ready for all those challenges, because they'll be out there, but they'll be fun, and uh, the rewards are great if you try hard, work hard, and do your best. Thank you, ISS. Okay, up next, our uh, question comes from Valley Center, Kansas. Valley Center, go ahead with your question. Thank you. My question is, was there anything you were not prepared for when you first went into space? Well, the first time I came into space, uh, well, the one thing I, I really wasn't prepared for, and I'm not sure anybody can be totally prepared for it, is that you are in a place now where there is no up and down. Your entire life, uh, even when you wake up in the morning before you open your eyes, you know which way is up and which way is down, and everything in your house is built for up and down, the walls, the way your faucets work, uh, everything is, uh, is based around gravity. And up here, you can be in any orientation, you can get really used to flying through a module, uh, using the ceiling as a floor or the wall as a floor if you'd like to, to get your orientations. 
and um, many times you'll you'll find yourself lost and if you drop something it can go instead of one direction to the floor it can go really in six different directions and it's really hard to find and keep track of things so I say that is the one most confusing thing that I wasn't prepared for when I came to space the first time. Thank you ISS. Okay up next is Hilo Hawaii. Hilo go ahead with your question please. Some of the advancements made in engineering and science due to research conducted aboard the International Space Station and who profit from these? That's a great question, and I'll give you two examples. You know, we have a uh, water processing system here, which, uh, in you know, short terms, uh, essentially turns pee back into drinking water, and so you know, it's really putting it through the the paces to try to make not so nice water turned into clean drinking water. And some of that technology has been used all over the world, particularly in places where we had natural disasters, a smaller version to uh, clean the water so people could have really nice, good, clean drinking water and helping them out in a more portable uh, way to be able to do that. Other things that we're doing up here that are going to help us in the science and space field, of course, are things like capillary flow, which are going to help us make better uh, engines, maybe the engines that don't need pumps that can last a little bit longer time take advantage of the capillary flow in microgravity. So that's just a couple examples of things that we're doing on board the space station that benefit folks back on the ground as well as advancements in technology and science in space. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Portland, Oregon. Portland, please go ahead with your question. Our question is for Sunny. How much control do you have over the space station? For example, do you use rockets to move the station to protect you from space debris? You know, that's a great question. In general, we don't really have to do much at all. The space station sort of takes care of itself as well as the ground controllers who are always watching the space station telemetry and making sure we're all okay up here. Uh, what they do also on the ground is track big space debris or space debris that's about a softball size. And we, of course, don't want to get hit by that. And so we can actually change the attitude of the space station to avoid that. And we also can do a reboost, which will bring us to a higher altitude so we can avoid that debris as well. Well, here on the space station ourselves, you know, if we had to, if we needed to, we are trained on the guidance, navigation, and control systems which monitor and can do some of those things. But in general, we have enough time, we can predict where these things are happening, and the folks on the ground um, put the algorithms together and they uh, start those maneuvers. So in general, we don't do too much maneuvering up here, but if we had to, we can. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Cicero, Illinois. Cicero, go ahead with your question. Cicero, do you copy? Okay, we're going to move on to Willis, Texas. Willis, Texas, go ahead with your question. What would you do if an astronaut had a serious medical emergency while on the International Space Station? Well, uh, it's a possibility, of course, uh, just like it is on Earth that anything could happen at any time. So we have a medical training staff in Houston that teaches us all about all the medical, um, the most likely medical events that could happen. And um, they give us, uh, and we're not all doctors. We do have some doctors who are astronauts. So you might want to go down that track someday if you'd like to be a doctor and then an astronaut. Uh, have one joining me soon in December. But uh, none of us on board right now are doctors, but we get some training. 
And uh, one of the things, for example, they teach us is CPR, something really everybody should learn uh, as early as they can. Um, up here, if we were to do CPR, we have our board right behind us. Sonny was just uh, looking at it. We have a board back here that's ready for an emergency at any time. We could strap a person down if they were having some kind of convulsions or something like that. Maybe if they got... Um, maybe they got some gas or some kind of poison or something from an event and you could strap them down and Sonny's showing how you would do the CPR on somebody because if you were to push on somebody on the board when you push down on them you would just fly across the module so Sonny's showing how she would put her feet on the ceiling and actually do her CPR against the patient on that board but we also get trained in how to give stitches how to do some uh, just some basic dental work uh, and just take care of each other, medications. We do a lot of diagnostics, eye exams, ear exams, and those kinds of things, and we report to the doctors. And then ultimately on the ground, we have doctors who are always on call for us. They can be ready to talk to us uh, in an instant at any time and help us with any crew member who has any kind of a medical emergency. That, that's a really great question. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Russell County, Virginia. Russell County, go ahead with your question. Thank you. While in space, how do you communicate with your families? That's another great question because it's really important to stay in touch with folks back on the ground. I think for both us up here and also our friends and family on the ground who are, of course, worrying and thinking about us. So, you know, we have an IP phone, internet protocol phone, when the satellite is lined up with a, you know, a satellite out in, when our antennas are lined up with a satellite out in space, uh, we have the ability to make a phone call. It happens to be like the same communication why we have video right now. Um, other things we have, of course, are email. We don't have instant messaging, un unfortunately. We have synced email, so every couple hours our email gets synchronized with the ground and then we get email back and forth. Um, we also have video conferences once uh, once a week on the weekend. Um, I get to see my dog because I can't talk to him on the phone, so he's actually with my parents and I get to see him on the video conference. Thank you, ISS. Up next, San Marino, California. San Marino, please go ahead with your question. Are there any developments involving space exploration that can contribute to combating some of the problems on Earth today, such as renewable energy sources or global warming? Well, uh, the energy we use here that lights the uh, lights up inside the laboratory and powers this microphone and camera you're looking at is all coming from the sun. So uh, the solar power uh, cells that we have out here are part of really kind of the development, engineering development of future space vehicles. And of course, these things can all be uh, applied to Earth-based Earth, Earth -based as well. Also, um, we do, you know, crew Earth observations uh, when you talk about um, the climate and that sort of thing, we can help with uh, photos and observations from space, not only from a space station, but other from space vehicles as well, to try to track what's going on, make analyses so that we can um, hopefully find out uh, exactly what kind of impacts perhaps we're having and, and make advancements there and just, uh, just study the problem. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Traverse City, Michigan. Traverse City, go ahead with your question. What's your favorite part about being a part of the SSEP? The last part of the question, what's your favorite part about being part of, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yes, that was, what is your favorite part about being involved in the Student Space Flight Experiments Program? Yeah, well, you know, I think that's a, part of, a big part of the whole reason why we're up here in the first place. You know, we're on the International Space Station. It's orbiting the planet. Um, 
but the next generation of explorers is out there. It's you guys, and uh, we're up here, hopefully, being part of this program to inspire you to for you to see how much fun it is, how cool it is to actually be an astronaut and be involved in the in developing the next generation of spacecraft and the things that that will, spacecraft will do, which is probably going to be going beyond low Earth orbit. So uh, I feel pretty honored to be part of it. I hope we're getting you guys psyched up because your future is huge. I'm a little bit envious. I wish I was about 20 years younger so I could be in your shoes, um, going to be doing the things that you're going to be doing with in regards to space and space travel. So um, very honored and uh, psyched to be part of this program. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you, ISS. Up next is Lake County, Indiana. Lake County, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Is there any downtime on the space station, and what do you do with that time? Well, uh, greetings. Uh, you're, you're in my home state there. I grew up in Indiana, so it's great to hear from you up in Lake County. Um, in our spare time, we uh, catch up on our communications with friends and family at home uh, first so that we can keep the, that, those relationships going, of course. And then uh, we uh, go to the window as often as we can. Uh, occasionally, I'll go to the window really early morning or even middle of the night and I'll find another astronaut all, already there <laughs> looking out because it's a great way to spend your time getting really familiar with our, uh, our beautiful planet. Um, and of course, uh, some of us have little little things we like to do in the zero gravity because uh, we know we won't be here long. It's a little bit like a dream being here. So there's some uh, there's things to play with and spin around. I have a little Soyuz in my pocket, and uh, it's fun to get those out. We this is the model of the little spacecraft we flew up in, and we spin as we come in here. So I can make this spin just like my own little spacecraft did on the way, and uh, <laughs> it's just kind of fun um, to see how things react and the dynamics, there's some kind of unexpected things up here. So we, we play around in the zero gravity and we look at our uh, Mother Earth most of the time. Thank you, ISS. Up next, Inwood, New York. Inwood, go ahead with your question, please. Okay, the question from Inwood, New York, ISS is, what was your first aha moment in space? I think on, uh, my first aha moment, of course, is when you get to space. You know, it only takes about eight and a half minutes or so to take the rocket ride up into space. And then, you know, the engines on the vehicle shut off. I was on a shuttle for my first flight. And then you're ready to take your helmet off and your gloves off. And when you do, it doesn't weigh anything and it starts to float away and your gloves start to float away. And literally your arms start to float. You know, on Earth, we don't realize it, but gravity is holding your arms down. Just like when you sleep in space, you, if you don't think about it, your arms will start to float back up again. So I think, of course, that had to be the biggest aha moment. It was just incredible. And it just makes you laugh because it's like, this is just really cool. So um, of course, that's number one. I think number two, I have to add number two, on a spacewalk, up on top of the space station, on a solar array, watching the aurora uh, hit the Earth. And when you see this green energy hitting the planet, uh, you sort of realize that, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of energy in the universe that's pretty much untapped, and we, we have a lot more to discover and learn about. So that really hit home. It was a huge aha moment. Thank you, ISS. We have time for one more quick question from El Paso, Texas. El Paso, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Have you ever seen anything in space that surprised or scared you? Well, I'll take it uh, just shortly and then I'll pass it off to Sunny. Uh, everything surprises you in space. Uh, from the time you get up, uh, cruising through a lab at nighttime with everybody sleeping and floating down a dark aisle to uh, just when you uh, lose control maybe of your drink or your water bag and the water particles just go every direction instead of falling on your floor. So surprising. I haven't fortunately really been scared yet. Uh, there are some times when things really get your attention. Uh, I remember coming up uh, in this last flight on the rendezvous 
day, uh, our Soyuz rendezvous was really aggressive and we got, uh, came out the station really fast. So there's a lot of things that make your heart beat quickly sometimes, but nothing uh, that was really, really scary for me. And I'll hand it, since that was the last question, I'll hand it back over to the commander of Expedition 33 for final words. So we wanted to just say thank you, if that was the last question, for letting us participate in uh, in this event with you. It's been great. The Smithsonian's a, a wonderful place, just amazing to be part of it. Uh, the ISS is just a wonderful place. Again, amazing to be an honor to be part of it. And um, we're, we're hoping, again, that we uh, are inspiring the next generations of explorers because this is just a stepping stone. ISS is great, but it's just a stepping stone. You guys, you guys are the next ones who are going to take the next big steps. So uh, get psyched out there, and uh, we're looking forward to watching you guys in the future. Thank you, ISS. Let's hear it for Commander Williams and Colonel Ford. Okay, we are going to continue uh, the questioning. Our next speaker is the Associate Administrator for Education at NASA, Leland Melvin. Leland is responsible for the development and implementation of the agency's education programs. Leland is also a veteran of two space shuttle missions to the International Space Station, serving as mission specialist on STS-122 in 2008 and STS-129 in 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Administrator and Astronaut Leland Melvin. Okay, how's everyone doing? Did you guys have a good time? Yeah. Well, it's just starting, okay? So we have a few more questions out there. I think we have Lincolnwood, Illinois. You want to ask, answer your question? Ask your question? missions and travels, does NASA work well and cooperate with the other agencies aboard the International Space Station, such as the European Space Agency, Russia, Canada, and Japan? That's a very good question. We work with all of those agencies, and when I think about the students in here and the students out there in the, in the, uh, in the internet land, you know, we have to work together as one big team, because if we're going to go to Mars one day as a civilization, it takes all of us to work together, so we work with all of these countries. We want to work with even more countries in the future. So, very good question. Next question is from New, uh, Penasaukin, New Jersey. How long are you? Oh, okay. How long are you in microgravity before you start to notice changes in your body or health, or and what are those changes? That's a very good question. Um, I was only in space for about 14 days maximum. And once you get there, your body does start to feel the effects of microgravity and some changes. But for the long duration space flight members, you know, they're there for six months at a time. And so if they don't work out and do resistive exercise, you know, push-ups and, and resistive, resistive things, that their muscles will atrophy and their bones will actually leach out the calcium. So they'll have, their bones will get weaker. So it's very important for long duration space flight that you do cardiovascular workouts as well as the uh, resistive exercise. Very good question. Thank you. Next we have Galva Holston, Iowa. What's your question? Ready? What do you think of the Student Space Flight Experiments Program? And what it does for students? Well, for the uh, space flight program for students, I think it's an opportunity to think about themselves as being researchers and scientists. You know, when I was a little boy, I mixed chemicals together and created an explosion in my mom's living room. And I don't want you guys to do that. But I think about you being little principal investigators that will send your experiments to the space station. Sonny's bringing back 23 experiments when she comes back home on Sunday and we'll see the results of those experiments. But this sets the tone to get you guys ready to be the next inventors, explorers, and scientists. 
It's a great opportunity for you to do that in that program. Good question. Next we have Guilford County, North Carolina. What are the challenges and advantages of working with astronauts from other countries? I think uh, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, the, 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 biggest, the biggest, I think, challenge that we have is sometimes the language barrier. In, you know, when we're in Russia, when we're in Russia, we learn Russian. Uh, when we're in the other countries, we try to learn some of those languages. But I think everyone comes together as a team because we have this, this outpost up 240 miles up, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. And we're working together as one civilization to advance ourselves for peaceful purposes. So the challenges are usually language, but the, it, the, the benefits are helping everyone on the planet advance as one civilization. Good question. Next we have Odebolt in Ida Grove, Iowa. What's your question? Yeah, how does it feel to be weightless and what was something that you like to do in microgravity that was not as easily done on Earth? Interesting question. Weightlessness was awesome. You could actually ball yourself up in a ball and be bowled down and knock over other astronauts. <laughs> so that's something you can't do on the ground. Um, playing with your food in space is pretty cool. I'll show a video about that a little bit later. But it's working together in this environment to see the advances for the future, for helping people here on the planet. And I think that's the biggest part of microgravity that's the beneficial piece of the experiments, the working together, the thinking about the future of exploration. Good question. Next we have Santa Monica, California. What's your question? What is the, what is the most difficult thing to adapt to when you get to the ISS? And when you return to the ISS, when you return to Earth from the ISS? Good question. The most difficult thing to adapt to? Hmm. I would say that's going to the bathroom. Because in space, everything floats. Number one's not so bad, but number two, that's the problem. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> we'll talk about that more later. <laughs> All right, next we have Chicago, Illinois. What's your question? Can you see hur hurricanes and other weather activity from space? And if so, what do they look like? Okay, I wasn't up there, but I'm sure that both, um, both Sonny and Kevin saw uh, the Hurricane Sandy from space, and it looks, you know, it's like the weather satellites that show you the pictures on the Weather Channel. It looks very similar to that, but we can track it for much longer times. We have our video cameras, we have our, you know, wide-angle lenses and, and, and long uh, zoom lenses, so you can see pretty much everything from that vantage point with different lenses. Very good question. Okay, next we're gonna have Stonewall, Manitoba, Canada. What's your question? Thank you. Hello, my question is, is the Canadian arm helpful, useful in space? Okay, is the Canadian arm helpful? Well, when I went to space, I was the robotic arm operator and I used Canada Arm 1 and Canada Arm 2 to install the European Space Agency's laboratory. So it was extremely helpful, and it was the only way that we could actually install these modules onto the space station. So yes, our Canadian friends came through with a great device. Good question. Next question is from New York City. What's your question from New York? Why is that? I would think that perfumes aren't allowed because the alcohol can kind of outgas and maybe get on different equipment. You, don't, you want to make sure that the things that you take up don't come out of their solution and get deposited on the, on the equipment on the space station. So that's, that's what I think. But that's a very good question. And our last question is from East Lyme, Connecticut. What's your question? Is 
Is East Lyme out there? Okay. Okay. We're going to go back to Cicero. Does Cicero have another question? There we go. How is life in space different from life on Earth? How is life different on space than life on Earth? Well, when Sunny comes back on Sunday, she's going to probably have this moment where she grabs her plate and she puts food on her plate, and then she probably turns and thinks that the plate's going to keep floating. <laughs> and it doesn't. It hits the ground. So thinking about how you do things in a 1G environment on the planet, in gravity, this gravitational pull, and how you can do things differently in space. A lot of that has to do with the physiological things that happen, well, you know, when you're eating, using the bathroom, as I mentioned, flying and floating around, but also with experiments. Like if you're doing an experiment on crystal growth, you can grow single crystals at a much larger, larger size than you can on the one gravitational pull on the, on the planet. So doing experiments and things like that can utilize the benefits of microgravity. Very good question. All right. Okay. Is East Lime on the line? East Lime, are you there? Going once. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for all those fantastic questions. Sonny's bringing back. Thank you. Sonny's bringing back the experiments um, on Sunday, as I mentioned, and you'll get to see the results of that work that's been done. I'm going to turn on my wireless mic real quick. I'm turning on the wireless mic because I'm going to roam around. Okay. You guys like that? Oh, come on. I can do better than that. Did you like that? Are you guys awake? All right. Well, how many of you dream? Any dreamers in here? What do, you, what do you dream about? You dream? Come and stand up. You don't want to stand up? Okay. <laughs> what is your dream? I dream about my future. She dreams about, what's your name? Kayla. Kayla. She dreams about her future. Is your future bright? It's very bright. How many of you dream about your future? And what you're going to do, be a scientist, an engineer, a ball player, whatever you want to be. But it starts with you living your dreams right now. What does that mean to you, living your dreams? Anyone want to help me? Yes. Exactly. He said, work hard now so your dreams can come true. But when I was a little boy, I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I was in middle school, I had no clue. Next slide, what I wanted to do. And if you look at the slides, if they're turning or... You want to help me here? Virtual click. You can go to the next slide. I had no clue. I love sports and I love science. Okay? And as I mentioned earlier, I had a chance to make this most incredible, I'm telling you, incredible explosion. But first, I made a skateboard. How many of you are skateboarders in here? Any skateboarders? Any football players? Basketball players, tennis, hockey, ice skating, soccer, volleyball, what, what else? Okay. All right. So I love sports as a kid, but my dad, I asked my dad for a skateboard when I was a little boy. He said, we don't have the money to buy you one. So what did I do? I didn't give up. I used my brain. At Dunbar Middle School, I went to the wood shop and I got a piece of wood and I made the board in the shop. So I had half of the solution was my board. The next piece was the trucks and the wheels. So I got a job delivering papers, doing odd things, made the money, and I've created my own skateboard. So using your brain, using your hands, using your innovation and curiosity is very important to getting the things that you want. So started that with skateboarding, then my mom gave me this chemistry set I made this huge explosion in the living room, which fueled my curiosity. I became a chemistry major from that. And then also sports was very important. Next slide. So where did that lead me? That led me to 
being a snowboarder, okay, led me to being a chemist, which you see here is a mad scientist in the chemistry lab, and it also led me to the NFL. Yes. How many of you want to play in the NFL? Okay. All right, you can do that. But the key is, if that doesn't work out, you got to have your education, right? I went to training camp. I was drafted in the 11th round to the Detroit Lions. I pulled a hamstring the second week in training camp. That was the end of my football career. But I had my education to fall back on, which allowed me to then become an astronaut. So again, you can do whatever you want to if you put your mind to it, but you gotta have your education. Our deputy secretary over here believes in that. You gotta have your education. We work together as a team with the Smithsonian, with General Daly, with Tony Miller in education to ensure you have all the tools you need to do anything you want to do, anything you believe in, anything you put your mind to. Next slide. Wait a minute. Somebody snuck this picture in here. These are my two dogs that I tried to get to space, but they wouldn't take them. Any, any, any dog owners in here? A few dog owners? Okay. So that's Jake and Scout. I tried to get them up there, but they wouldn't let me take them. Next slide. So I, t I flew on two flights, STS-122 and STS-129, and both Sonny and Kevin and I trained together. Sonny was in my class in the 1998 astronaut class. So I, I got a degree in chemistry. I went and got a, ma a master's degree in material science engineering. I worked as an engineer for 11 years at NASA Langley, and then I applied to the astronaut corps, and I got into the astronaut corps. My first flight was in 2008. We took up uh, the European Space Agency's laboratory. Next slide. And I think the most incredible part of this mission was we had our friends from Canada talking about the Canada arm. If you look at that top white piece, that's the Canada arm. How many of you play video games? Most of you, right? So if you can play video games, if you're experts at playing video games, you can fly the robotic arm. All of our training is done in a simulator, just like your video games a simulator, right? Nintendo, Xbox, PlayStation, Wii, what else? DS, PS2, PS3, okay, all your games you play, you will be expert robotic arm operators if you can work that game. So that's what I did, I installed this onto the International Space Station, we grew the space station by another module. Next slide. And then after this installation, we had this wonderful meal. If you look at this picture, we have people from all around the world, African American, Asian American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander of the International Space Station. So as you saw, Sonny is now the female commander of the International Space Station. The first one was Dr. Peggy Whitson. And we're having this meal traveling around the planet at 17,500 miles per hour. Every 90 minutes, there is a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. That's what space is like. You see things from blue lagoons to volcanoes erupting, to brown mountains, to just beautiful, beautiful landscape. And so this picture here, we're having a meal. Dan's floating up at the top like a bat. And if you look over to the left on the screen, you see there's some hot sauce. How many people like hot sauce? Because in space, your taste buds aren't as sensitive. Some people's taste buds aren't as sensitive. So we spice the food up a little bit. Next slide. And I took my Detroit Lions jersey to space. I was floating around, we played football in space. How many of you played football before? Some of you? Well, try to play that in space. The thing is, you've got to push off and float and tackle people, and you keep floating until you hit something like a wall. Okay? Not good. Next slide. My second mission, STS-129, we flew up with um, our crew, a couple of Marines, and uh, Butch Wilmore, Scorch in the front. There's uh, Comrade. And if you look in the back right, there's Dr. Peggy Whitson who is now the chief of the astronaut office. So she went from being the commander of the space station to being the chief of the office. So ladies, as you know, you can do it just like the men, right? Next slide. I'm gonna show you a quick little movie about what it's like to work and live in space. Sonny and Kevin were doing some flips and showing you a few things, but I'm gonna show you what it's like to fly and work in space. About, if you can kill the sound on that, if about three and a half hours before we launch, we're sitting in this vehicle and I'm, See that window on the right? I'm at the bottom, the bottom of the window. I'm strapped in, I'm on my back, and we're waiting to actually launch into space. So, it's Sunny said it takes about eight and a half minutes to get to space. 
So the time that you're preparing about a year in advance to get you ready, all these people, thousands of people from around the world are focusing and working to help you get ready to go to space. It only takes you eight and a half minutes to get there. And we had, um, we had this uh, spare parts in the payload bay. We had to use the robotic arm. We had a number of other things we had to do. We were going to bring back our, our, uh, our colleague, Nicole Stott, because she was in space for four months. So we're bringing her back. I think we're having some technical difficulties. So you always have to be prepared for your backup plan, right? What's your, what's your backup plan? You got a backup plan? OK, well, think about your backup plan. If one thing doesn't work out, you'll be ready for something else. Launch directors in Houston, I mean, in, in Florida, getting us ready. The countdown, three, two, one, liftoff. We've got a number of people um, around the area taking pictures, getting the orbiter ready. Um, as you see, Space Shuttle Atlantis, which we have retired now, which is going to end up in Florida, is sitting on the runway and on the launch pad there. I think we're counting down to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Activated. I'm a little early, huh? 10, 9, 8, 7, Here we go. 6, 5. Help me count. 5, 3, 2, 1. Liftoff. Lift so if you look at this picture, I'm in, the, I'm in the back on the right. And if you see my wrist, I'm holding my wrist up in the air. I've got a mirror on my wrist that I'm actually looking out the window, the overhead window, and I can see back down to the ground. And the plume makes a connection with the ground, connects to us, and I can see where my family and friends are sitting down on the ground. It's, it's an incredible moment. After two and a half minutes, the solid rocket boosters get jettisoned. And so eight and a half minutes later, we are now in space. The external tank, the orange tank, falls back down to the earth, it burns up, falls into the ocean. So we're after docking. And now we start doing our work. So we had a lot of spare parts to add to the space station. As you know, the space shuttle has retired, so we used the robotic arm, both the Canada arm one and two, one's on the shuttle, the other one's on the space station. So we're using that to put these spare parts up there so when the shuttle retires, we can actually use the arm in space to attach these parts to the space station. So that's what you see there. This side is on the, on the robotics workstation on the station side. And this is the Canada Arm 1 on the shuttle side. We use targets just like you do in your video games. Here's my football game in space. Boom! I took a hit, you know? Stupid astronaut tricks. We're eating our food. In space, you transfer things with your feet. Pull yourselves with your hands. Because if you're using your hands to hold something, in both hands, as soon as you get to a, a place, you've got to slow yourself down. So here's Randy doing the Superman maneuver. Look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> Food's very important in space. We had our Euro night, so a lot of our colleagues from around the world were sharing their delicacies from around the world. We had our, our Russian colleagues. Here's Nicole in the purple shirt. We brought her home. There's me floating food to my mouth, as usual. There's Bobby. There's Randy floating food to his mouth. So those are the kind of things you can do with your food in space. Mike and, and everyone else is saying, mm-mm, good. Nicole was the last transfer item. We transferred her over. She was item number 414. I asked the ground how much she was supposed to weigh. They said, you don't ask that. <laughs> Here's playing with your food in space, M&Ms and water bubbles. This is chemistry. This is surface tension. This is physics and chemistry at work in play. The gravity starts to build back up as we come home, so I'm dropping my book. My arms feel really, really heavy. I've been in microgravity for all this time, and now the gravitational pull of the Earth and the Gs we're pulling as we come back down to the ground make it really hard to move your arms and to flip the switches. At about 300 knots, Butch Wilmore, he's the pilot. His, his really important job is to flip the switch to let the landing gear down. As you see, he did a great job. We came home. We've been in space for about 13 days. As you see on the inset on the right, the wheels heat up quite a bit because all that energy that we were in space with has now got to be dissipated down on the ground. Parachute comes out, helps us rotate back onto the uh, tarmac there. And we have been in space for four, 13 days and traveled over 4.9 million miles. So if I could only have half of those frequent flyer miles, I'd be set, right? 
Let's go to the next slide. After a couple hours, we kind of decondition ourselves. Um, you know, you take a lot of fluids, use the bathroom, those kind of things. Get your space legs, get your sea legs back and uh, walk around. Here's the space station assembly complete. Sonny was talking to you from, I think, the US laboratory. So that's back on the other side. Next slide. This is the, this is the atmosphere that keeps us alive on the planet. This is called the, the uh, Earth limb. And you see a sunset here. Next slide. Here's Sonny. Big hair and eating chicken with chopsticks. Next slide. Sonny and I, she mentioned her dog, Gorby. Sonny and I had two dogs. And our dogs were actually on the Dog Whisperer. So you see Sonny there with her dog, Gorby. And there's my dog there, Scout. And we were trying to get them to get along on the ground. Next slide. NASA is the place for everyone. How many of you have done robotics before? Any robotics operators in here? Lego robotics? Well, ro robotics are very important. When we want to get that, we have this rover on Mars right now. So think about trying to do things with your hands, building and creating. Like I made that skateboard. Think about the things that you can build to help society. Next slide. Legos. We have Legos in space right now. We have assembled Legos and curriculum for teachers to actually teach space physics using Legos. Next slide. Away. Oh, Who has a smartphone? How many of you have a smartphone? OK, there's an app called the Astro app that my niece, Sierra, when I came home, she showed me that she's going to be an astronaut. She believes one day she's going to be an astronaut, so she put herself in this astronaut uniform. So the things that you want to do with your lives, find the people that are doing them now and, and try to understand how, what their path was and make that path your own. Next slide. Curiosity on Mars. How many of you know, how many of you know about Curiosity on Mars? It's a rover that's looking for past signs of life on Mars. It's got a robotic arm. It's got all kinds of sensors for making measurements. It's pretty cool. Next slide. How many of you play Angry Birds? Most of you play Angry Birds. OK. So if you play Angry Birds, think about this. This is one little thing I want to leave you with. I've got a smartphone. I have Angry Birds on this phone. Angry Birds Space, in three days, listen to this, three days sold 10 million copies for 99 cent. So if, what's your name? Steven? Javon. Javon. If Javon had developed Angry Birds Space, you'd be a multimillionaire. Think about it. So instead of being a user of the technology, be a developer. Create the technology, and you will not only help advance our civilization, you will get paid too. And you can take all of us to Disney World. <laughs> but seriously, though, you're playing these games, you're experts, you're masters at playing the games. Think about how you can be creators and developers of this technology. Next slide. How many of you know Will I Am? OK, Will I Am. We, he wrote a song called Reach for the Stars. We beamed the song to the rover on Mars and beamed it back to let students know about how these satellites and how this deep space network can actually send things like music from another, from another planet. And so that's all science and physics and math. So if you know those things, if you want to be a musician, you also have to know digital signal processing and all these things that when you make your, when you make your music and your MP3 files, that's all technology. Next slide. International Space Station Education, we have apps that you can download, data coming directly from space station. So the things that Sonny and Kevin are doing in space, you can actually monitor them on the ground on your smartphone. Next, step, next slide. And then STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's very important. That's the future of ensuring that we have a strong economy, that we have a creative civilization that's going to allow us to be the next generation of explorers. So you guys in here, as Sonny mentioned, are those next generation of explorers. Do you believe that? Oh, come on. That's weak. Can you, do you believe that? Yes. I still can't hear you. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay, who's going to Mars one day? What does it take to get to Mars? Hard work. What else? Okay, what else? Dedication. What else? Teamwork. What else? You say, eat your green beans? Yeah, Tony mentioned 
You got to be healthy. You got to be strong. If you're not strong and healthy, when you get to space, in the shade, it's minus 250 degrees. In the sun, it's positive 250 degrees. So your body in your spacesuit has to be able to handle all of these different things. So your health is very important in space, as it is on the ground, too. Next slide. So we talked about the student space, space flight experiment program. As I mentioned, Sonny's going to bring back these experiments. The students that have worked on this are going to be future scientists and engineers, astronauts, whatever you want to be. But it starts with right now, getting exactly what you need right now to be that next generation of explorers. Next slide. How many people have ever said something to you like this, that you can't do something? Has anyone ever told you that you can't do something? People have told me that my whole life. They've told me, I can't do this. You can't play in the NFL. You can't be a football player. You can't be a scientist. You can't be an engineer. I've been told that. You know the problem with you can't? What's the problem with you can't? It's an apostrophe and a T. Next slide. Because if you take away the apostrophe and a T, it becomes you can. Don't let anyone bully you. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't achieve your dreams because you can do anything you put your mind to. You believe that? Yeah. Uh, come, uh, do you believe that? Yeah. All right, next slide. So live your dreams. I appreciate what you're doing. I want to see some of you walking on the Martian surface one day. I want to thank General Daly at the Smithsonian, Tony Miller from the Department of Education. We have some other friends here from uh, Challenger Centers, Lance, and a number of other people here from Discovery Education, Kelly Denson. But I just want to thank everyone for having an investment in your future because you are truly the future of our civilization. Thank you very much. God bless. All right. Up next is the director for the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, Dr. Jeff Goldstein. Dr. Jeff is responsible for overseeing the creation and delivery of national science and education initiatives with a focus on Earth and space. In addition, his planetary science research includes the development of techniques for measuring global winds on other planets using large telescopes here on Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jeff Goldstein. Hello, DCPS. Hello. Hello to all of the students across the country and in Canada. Can, can I hear you? So it's, it's a virtual cheer, right? It's a virtual cheer. Well, I thought I would take a few minutes to talk about the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. We're very proud of this initiative. And I think the, the best way to start is to say that it was all based on something very fundamental, which is that we humans are born to explore. We humans are born curious. And, and just to make that point, every parent remembers that very magical time when their child was just capable of expressing themselves, just capable of speaking. And every parent remembers the questions started at that moment. Question after question, an unending stream of questions from that child, which is, which is something that children are wired to do. We are born to ask those questions. We are born curious. And just as an aside, next time a child comes with you with this barrage of questions, take it as a gift because they chose you. And so not only are we born curious, but we also have another capacity as humans, which is that we're born evidence-based learners. Ever, ever since we are capable of interacting with our corner of the universe, our world, we like to poke it and see what happens. And we look at evidence of, of that interaction because that allows us to learn. Evidence allows us to learn how the world works. So curiosity and evidence-based learning are innately human. We are born that way. So how does that hook up with science as practiced by professional scientists and engineers using an inquiry approach to the world, which we call the scientific method. Well, it's kind of interesting because science, as practiced by professionals, is nothing but organized curiosity. 
And science is evidence-based learning for the entire human race. Science, as it is practiced by professionals, grows organically from what it means to be human. And so if, if what we are grows into science naturally, that speaks to what science education ought to be in the 21st century. Um, we believe that we've got to stop teaching science with a focus on the book of knowledge. Because if science education is about introducing our next generation to science, we have to recognize that science was never a book of knowledge. Science has always been a journey. It's a process. It's a wondrously human, emotional journey. And it all starts with the gift of a question. And the scientist will hone this art form in terms of how to get from a question in, in search of an answer by navigating through the noise of the universe around us. And if you ask that gift of a question and you get to an answer, which, may, which, which is, is akin to pulling back the veil of nature and seeing something wholly new, it might be wholly new to you, it might be wholly new to the human race, but regardless, the act of that exploration is wondrous, and you can't help but have a smile break across your face. And it propels you to ask more questions because this is a, this is a lifelong experience. So if, if science is process, and science education ought not to focus on um, the book of knowledge as science, because that's a misconception that we're providing the public, Science education also ought not be about talking at science, talking about science, because our students, our children, are perfectly capable of being researchers right now. They do it every day. They survive on a daily basis the world, uh, the world around them. They are capable of being immersed in the journey in science, and that's what science education ought to be in the 21st century. So that's how we, this program got its, its start from a philosophical vantage point. And so to put the, you know, the rubber on the road, the question was, what could we offer to, to, to the United States? What could we offer internationally to give this opportunity to our children? And we wanted some opportunity that would be so powerful, so high visibility, so out of this world, that it would grab kids by the collar and teachers by the collar and say, how could you not do this? And so what we did was we worked with a company called Nanorax, which is working with a Space Act agreement with NASA to utilize the International Space Station as a national laboratory and open up commercial access. And we're able to say to a community, a school district, we're going to give you a real microgravity research mini laboratory and all launch services to get it to the International Space Station, and an astronaut will operate it as overseeing that payload. And so the, the school and, and, and the mini lab can contain a single experiment, and the school district now has this wonderful, professional, valuable, but limited resource, and so the school system says to hundreds of students across the district, break into teams like real researchers. Each team design your own real research program, a real experiment, which could be over a wide range of disciplines. It could be mi microbial, it could be protein crystal growth, food preservation, microaquatic life. Um, it's their research. They own it. They're empowered to ask the questions that they want to see an answer to. And they design a real experiment con constrained by the operation of that mini lab, which is used by professional researchers and constrained by flight operations to and from low Earth orbit so that we, we work directly with NASA <coughs> through nanoracks. And each of these teams writes a real proposal, a formal proposal for what they want to do, just like professional researchers. They go through a formal two-step proposal review process, just like professional researchers. And one of those experiments is selected for flight it goes through a NASA flight safety review at Toxicology at Johnson Space Center, and the entire community rallies behind the team that's going into space on behalf of that community. So right now, there are 23 experiments aboard the International Space Station that have been overseen by Commander Williams since it got there on the SpaceX-1 Dragon vehicle. And those 23 experiments represent over 7,000 students fully immersed in experiment design and proposal writing across the US. We, we received for this particular 
flight opportunity over 2,000 proposals. And right now, in 24 of the 55 SSEP communities across the country and in Canada, 24 of those communities are tuned into this video conference. And there are 9,500, and Jack, it was 57? 9,557 students out there. And so, um, on behalf of all of those students, to all of the teacher facilitators that made this happen in all of those communities, to all of the administrators, to the over 280 partner organizations that made this happen, including 26 space grant lead institutions, to NASA, to NANORACS, to the National Air and Space Museum and the Smithsonian, to the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, our national partners, on behalf of those students, thank you. All right, our final guest is Assistant Secretary for Education and Access for the Smithsonian Institution, Claudine Brown. Claudine is responsible for defining the Smithsonian's education program. She oversees two of the Smithsonian's educational organizations, the National Science Resources Center and the Smithsonian Center uh, for Education and Museum Studies, as well as coordinating 32 education-based offices in museums and science centers. Ladies and gentlemen, Assistant Secretary Claudine Brown. Thank you. So first, I would like to say thank you to this audience. And I'd like for you to give yourselves a round of applause, all of you. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I've learned from you and about you today that make you pretty spectacular. First of all, you ask impressive questions, and you ask them for yourselves, and you ask them for your peers, and we all learned from what you had to ask. So thank you for every school, every student who came up with questions to ask of the astronauts who were with us today. The second thing that I'd like to thank you for is information about yourselves. When Leland spoke, how many of you said that you played sports? Can you raise your hands again? Thank you. So here's what we know about that. We know that those of you who play sports know how to behave as a team. You know how to support one another. You know how to block for one another, and you know how to facilitate someone else's successes because one person's success is a success for each of you. And that is a skill set that you will use in the sciences as well as in sports. So we commend you for that, and we encourage you to know and understand that very little of what you learn is not going to be useful. So Leland also mentioned the fact that many of you play video games. Can you raise your hands if you're playing video games? So what does that have to do with today? Again, you are mastering skills that can play a part in your lives if, as scientists if that is the direction you choose to move in. So when you play video games, you go from one level to the next. You know when you've made achievements, and you aspire to move to the next highest level. And that, too, will be a part of the work that you do in the future. And even though it may seem like play, when you love your work, your work feels like play. So we want you to know that when you pursue careers in the sciences, it will also be fun, as was exhibited for us today. And the final thing that I would say to you is, is that many of you are here today because you are a part of the SSEP experiments which means that you are really pursuing your dreams. You're doing experiments, and you have thought of experiments that were done in space, and we will all learn from your questions. So we want to thank you for coming up with great experiments. So on behalf of Wayne Clough, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, and General Jack Daly, who is the director of this museum, and all of the teachers who work with you, and our colleagues from NASA, we want to thank you for helping us to learn from you. And we want to thank you for supporting your friends and peers in their pursuits. 
I think that you're pretty awesome. Thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program for today. I'd like to thank our participants, Director General Jack Daly, Deputy Secretary Tony Miller, Commander Sonny Williams, Colonel Jeff Ford, Associate Administrator Leland Melvin, Center Director Jeff Goldstein, and Assistant Secretary Claudine Brown. I'd also like to thank NASA, the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education, the U.S. Department of Education, and all of the wonderful SSEP communities out there who made this program possible. We hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you very much.